Again, my name is uh, Tony McDonald, and I'm the director of the Urban Coast Institute uh, at Monmouth University. And so, uh, really, um, uh, what, what we do at, at the Urban Coast Institute is work with um, uh, faculty, students, and communities to actually engage um, around how do we manage, um, as humans living in this coastal environment, um, how do we address some of the challenges that we um, have. And I think this is a particularly great opportunity also to show, um, really thank particularly um, uh, Patrick Murray from the Polling Institute, because really one thing um, uh, that we found in our, in our work is that really unless you understand um, where people are at, what they're thinking about these issues, it's difficult to really uh, develop strategies to do it, whether legal strategy or any other strategy to address that. So really, uh, really thank Patrick for coming out tonight and leading um, this discussion, but also um, informing us a little bit about what people's views are on marine uh, plastics. So thank you, Patrick. I do want to call out and also um, thank uh, uh, Professor Randy Abate, who is the uh, Reckness Endowed uh, Chair of uh, Marine and Environmental uh, Law and Policy. And Randy um, has been instrumental in many programs at the university, but in this case, in inviting um, our keynote speaker uh, to Monmouth, and that's um, Professor um, Susan Faraday um, from the University of New England. So she's on campus for a couple of da days as a visiting scholar. And, and one of her areas of, of interest in a recent article she wrote is about um, the impact of um, marine plastics on fisheries. And so really gave Randy and I the idea that we could pull in some local talent. This is an issue internationally, globally, uh, nationally, and it's certainly an interest uh, locally um, about plastics in the ocean. So we really thought this was a chance to bring together some of the uh, great minds um, here um, in the state uh, with Susan to engage um, in this discussion. So tonight we're going to, the, 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 the topic we, we've talked about is uh, marine uh, plastics, law, science, and action. And each one of our panelists today represents, I think they're all scientists in a part, they're all lawyers and legal people in a part, and they're all action, action and activist people, but really we're really looking at this in, in a way through um, several different lenses, which I think is really part of the solution, understanding how to connect those dots and also connect them in a way that is meaningful uh, for the public. So I'm just going to do a quick, uh, again, in there is a, a, a more detailed description of all the panelists um, uh, in the program tonight, but um, we're going to proceed tonight with um, Patrick setting up some sort of introductory remarks to kick us off, but we're going to start with uh, Susan Faraday, as I mentioned, to give us some keynote remarks a little bit on her perspectives um, based on her article and her other work uh, that she's done. She has a very distinguished background, not only at the U University of New England, but also the director of the Marine Law Program at Roger Williams um, Law School and um, uh, also with the Conservation Law Foundation and um, other groups. So a long uh, work and she's been a colleague in many different iterations over the years. So she'll start us off with her perspectives um, about some of the, the challenges, but also maybe some new legal responses that really we might think about in trying to address that issues. Uh, we'll then shift gears a little bit and turn it over to Keith. Um, and Keith is a professor of toxicology at Rutgers University School of the Environment and Biological Science. And uh, he'll talk a little bit more particularly to some of the science aspect, but really I think things that folks don't know about microplastics and the fact it's not in addition to the things, the pictures you see about um, balloons and plastics and uh, bottle caps and other issues, um, there are little bits of microplastics that are getting into the food chain and causing significant risks and disruptions of the ecosystem. So really kind of give us a close-up scientific uh, eye at some of those emerging challenges and other things, I'm sure. Uh, and then we're going to conclude at least the remarks with um, Cindy Ziff. And uh, if you're from New Jersey or actually from anywhere in the U.S., you should know Cindy Ziff because she has actually been uh, a leader in um, um, really keeping our oceans um, free, clean, wild, and open and usable for us. So um, we thank Cindy. But tonight she really has also um, in her role as um, <clears throat> at, the, um, at, at her organization right now, Clean Ocean Action, really they have a very – very uh, impressive um, initiative on marine plastics, not only educating the public, but also how, hoping to galvanize some political uh, and other action in response to the challenge. So we'll conclude with her, and then we'll turn it back over to Patrick for a few remarks on his poll and um, uh, to lead a discussion, which, again, given our, our robust and intimate community, hopefully you will all join in actively in questions and having the discussion because we really need, want to take advantage of everybody um, that we have here. So. With that, I'll turn it over to Patrick if he wants to make any opening remarks before we, we uh, turn it over to our speakers or, um, right, thanks. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, it's my pleasure and um, as part of this uh, uh, 
panel and the discussion, um, we did conduct a poll of New Jersey residents about uh, plastics and what they know about it. We'll talk, I'll talk about that after our speakers go through the meat of the matter. Um, but part of t tonight is to cover all those bases of, of the science and the action. And, and I will then kind of come in at the end with um, what are the political and policy challenges that we have to face and try to overcome uh, in order to move forward. So without further ado, I'd like to start off with our keynote speaker, uh, Susan Faraday. I usually don't need a mic, but I'll <laughs> try not to blow anybody out of the water here. So I want to thank Randy and Tony and the staff uh, for making me feel very welcome here at Monmouth. It's terrific to be here, and I look forward to sharing some thoughts with you today. So let's see if I remember how to drive this. There we go. So this is my perspective. I got a graduate, uh, earned my undergraduate degree in science, and then I went to uh, law school. And this is my sweet spot, is that intersection of law, science, and policy. So I'm thrilled that we've got somebody that's going to really dig into the science, because that's not me. Um, I like to see how does the science inform what we think about in terms of policy? How do we think both from a legal perspective as well as, you know, sort of ground level human behavior perspective? How do we change behavior in accord with behaviors that we think we should change? So that's the perspective I'm going to be sharing with you tonight. There we go. So I teach a class at University of New England uh, to mostly sophomores on marine pollution. And this was my gateway into the world of plastics. I designed this course five years ago. I'm teaching it for the sixth time this year. And this is the format of this course. So we talk about all kinds of pollutants. And for every one, we do this template. We talk about where it comes from, we talk about what it does, and we talk about what we do about it. And one of the themes of the course is not all pollutants are created equal and not all solutions are created equal. So for example, um, with oil spills, oil is a, a naturally occurring substance, but when we concentrate it in lots of places like tankers and things go wrong, it can have catastrophic effects. So we, and we know we're learning more and more about long-term effects of oil spills, that oil can degrade, there are bacteria that will naturally eat oil, but not necessarily in this quantity and not necessarily in these kinds of places where we're having oil spills, right? Um, so the response to oil spills, you mop it up with skimmers, you spray dispersants on it, you try to keep it from happening, number one, and after Exxon Valdez, we passed a very important piece of legislation that has really helped reduce the risk of oil spills from tankers. Not effective when you have a rig in the Gulf of Mexico that blows up because they're drilling in a mile deep of water. but. Um, so that's one, that's one example of, okay, problem impacts solutions, right? Something like DDT, not a naturally occurring compound, super toxic. We used to think it was really great that it was super toxic. Then we learned it's not so good for the environment. It stays in the environment forever. It biomagnifies, it bioaccumulates throughout the food chain. It's just bad stuff. So the solution to that is just don't use it anymore, right? With something like nutrients, I just have your big ugly pipe spewing stuff out there because that's usually what people think of when you talk about pollution. So nutrients, I mean, anybody here take a shower today, flush a toilet, right? That's, nutrients come from us, they come from other places too, but uh, so nutrients occur naturally, they will degrade naturally in the right conditions over time. When we have too many of them in one place, um, they can cause problems. So everybody's probably heard of the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, right, caused by agricultural runoff. So nutrients is a different sort of pollutant. It will degrade over time, it's naturally occurring, it's not toxic, it doesn't stay around forever like DDT or PCBs, but we can manage it. We know how to treat wastewater. We have a law called Clean Water Act in the United States. Um, we know how to manage that. So as I was teaching this class over the last couple of years, we're hearing more and more about plastics. I'm just not pointing this to the right spot. I don't know what to do. There we go. So the chapter in our text and our discussion is about the 
global issue of marine debris. So marine debris comes from a lot of places. It comes from land. It comes from uh, activities at sea, whether it's shipping activity or fishing activity. Um, has all kinds of impacts. It doesn't look very nice. It can be in, in dangerous to, uh, to wildlife. We all know that it can make our beaches not very nice to deal with. And as we were getting more and more into the plastic stuff, um, I had to think more and more about this, this sort of source impact solutions. What, you know, what kind of pollutant really is plastic? Well, so a few things that we know about marine debris. This is from the NOAA Marine Debris Monitoring and Assessment Project. Um, and I know it's probably little for those in the back. Um, but so there's plastic rope and net is 27%. Bottle containers and caps is 24%. Plastic beverage bottles, 11%. Cigarettes, 10%. Food wrappers, 9%. You sort of see how it's going down. Um, so a lot of stuff related to us, a lot of food and beverage packaging related to us, and a lot of plastic. And we know about lots of impacts. We were talking before we started about the turtle with the straw. Have we all seen the turtle with the straw? Everybody's seen the turtle with the straw. Every single one of my undergrads has seen the turtle with the straw. When we start talking about marine debris, that's all I got to say. Who's seen the video of the turtle with the straw? Yep. And they come in with their water bottles and their reusable straws. It made a huge impact. Um, but we know that marine debris has impacts on other wildlife as well. And I spared you. There's lots of gory pictures on impacts of marine debris and entanglements. So, um, but it has impacts on us too. Uh, plastic debris on, on beaches, particularly medical waste, can be not very nice for us as well. Oh boy. Want me to hit it? Yeah, well, if somebody, if somebody could drive, that would be awesome. I don't know which, I don't know where it's trying to pick it up. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Well, so I started, again, thinking more and more about plastic. What kind of pollutant is it, and why is it so troublesome? Well, there's a few problems with plastic. Plastic piles up worldwide. This is a graph from uh, a 2018 article, uh, and you can just see the trajectory. This just goes up to 2015. But one thing that's always surprising with, uh, with my undergrad students is how quickly we started using a lot of plastic. We've survived as humans with packaging of all kinds that wasn't plastic for a really long time. Um, and our demand for this is not going away. It is at ramping up, if anything. The other thing, so, you know, I noticed recycling bins on the Monmouth campus. We have recycling bins on the UNE campus, too. And we think recycling is great. Yay, recycling. Well, most plastic isn't actually recycled. So we're producing a whole bunch more of it. Um, and we're not recycling very much of it. It's only 9% on that graph, yes. Um, most of it ends up in landfills, 79% landfills or in the natural environment. 12% is incinerated. So we're cranking out a lot of this, and we're not very good at getting rid of it afterwards. OK, so there's a lot of plastic out there. Well, what else can we think about? So when we're thinking about plastic in the marine environment, okay, where's the source? Where is it coming from? All right, we're making a lot of it. We're not very good at recycling it. Well, over 80% of ocean plastic comes from land-based sources. It's not the cruise ships. They have their problems, too. It's not necessarily the fishing boats, although they have their problems, too. But 80% of the plastic is coming from land-based sources. Only 20% is coming from the ocean-based sources, like fisheries and other vessel operations. Um, 75% comes from waste that we're not even collecting. We're not even using the recycling bin. It's just poor waste management. 25% um, of that waste uh, leaks into the ocean after it's been collected. So even when we do pick it up, maybe the recycling bin, the lid comes off, and it gets into the ocean that way. And what we also know is that, uh, and I think this is for, Cindy may know this off the top of her head, I think this is the second year in a row that the International Coastal Cleanup has now said that the majority of trash that we're finding in our beach cleanups is plastic. Two years in a row, the top 10 items are all plastic. And they've been collecting this data for 40 some years, a long time. And it's only been in these last couple of years that the top 10 items are plastic. Okay, so there's a lot of it out there. We're not very good at managing it on land. Um, and it is definitely in the oceans. Who here has heard of the Great Garbage Patch? Everybody, right? Newsflash, the Great Garbage Patch 
looks like that. The mythology of this floating island of giant pieces of marine debris, it's not there. So the other thing we're learning about marine debris is it doesn't go away. It's persistent, kind of like that DDT compound, right? Breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces, hence the term microplastics, which we're going to hear a little more detail about later. Um, so this is really what it looks like through the water column. So it's almost a, a soup, if you will. So there's a lot of it out there. It's in little itty bitty pieces. And we're terrible at managing how it's getting into the environment. Next. So what's wrong with all this plastic out there? The research on this has exploded in the last three to four years. It is really unbelievable how quickly we've identified that this is a problem. Um, but as with a lot of research, sometimes the headlines don't give you the complete story. But here's some of the things that people are worried about. So it's everywhere. We're finding it in the deep ocean. We're finding it in the Arctic, where there aren't a lot of people. We're finding it in the Antarctic. And we're finding it in animals. Um, here's another quote from The Guardian in last March, uh, that microplastics is actually way worse than we thought it was. Uh, this was a study in, in Manchester, England, and shows that billions of particles flooded into the sea from rivers in just one year and we're finding it in, in animals. Okay, well, why do we care about that? Actually, sorry, go back. Um, so couple, there's a lot we don't know about microplastics. Okay, so it's out there, it's in the environment. We know it's getting into, into animals. Uh, it's getting into us. I, if you start looking at your life with a plastic lens on it, when you're in, using the bathroom next time, look at how much plastic is around you. When you're in the grocery store, you know, and you get that single-use plastic bag and you put your apples in there, the plastic water bottle, if you use one, the plastic cup I drank my water out of having dinner tonight over in the dining hall. Plastic is everywhere, and those microplastic particles are probably getting into our food chain in many, many ways. But seafood is really receiving a bulk of attention right now. We don't really know if those particles have a physical impact on us or on the animals that are ingesting them. We don't know if the material they're actually made of is toxic. We don't know if they're actually glomming onto toxic compounds and carrying more of them in you. There's so much we don't know. Um, but we know, we, we know it's out there. We don't know it's in animals. We know it's in us. So some solutions. So uh, recycling is always an obvious one people talk about. We know we're not very good at it. Um, we also know in the last couple of years that the market for recycling and how well that works is a frail thing. So counting on recycling to fix this is probably not a great strategy. Still a good thing to do. I'm not, not saying that. But when we're thinking about sort of strategies and how to think about implementing them, recycling is not going to get us out of this mess. Again, we only started using plastic for packaging in you know, the 1940s, 1950s. It's very recent. And we're, it's everywhere on everything. Now, one other specialty that UNE has besides marine programs is we have the only medical school in uh, the state of Maine, and we have a dental school. Think about when you're at the dentist, how many individually wrapped plastic pieces of stuff they're using. Well, I kind of like that because I want it to be hygienic. So there are some cases where we may want to think differently about the plastics that are in our everyday lives. But there's probably an awful lot of everyday packaging we could do without and we could rearrange. I don't know if any of you have small children, but when you get to the point where they have uh, the toys for Christmas that come in these, they're impenetrable. You cannot get into the plastic clamshell thing on Christmas morning. Does it really need to be in that much plastic and does it need to be that kind of plastic? So just thinking about packaging is, I think, a big one. Um, beach clamps are great. They're good to do. If you're keeping it from getting into the ocean, that's great. That's fewer big things that are going to turn into small things. But it's not turning off the pipe. That's the problem. It's great for public awareness. So are things like reusing your straws. So are things like reusing your water bottle. Those are all good things to do. But it's not turning off the pipe of that massive amount of consumption and the massive amount of waste management or mismanagement that's putting plastic trash into the oceans. So when I started thinking about this with my law policy thing, and so what kind of pollutant do we have? Okay, it's persistent. It doesn't seem like it's going away anytime soon. It could be toxic. Well, how do we manage those other kinds of things? Well, we could ban it, like we ban DDT and PCBs and all that. That's going to be really hard. Um, and maybe we don't necessarily need to do that. 
Well, if it's persistent like nutrients, we have ways to manage nutrients in wastewater treatment plants. You know, we have filters, we have chlorine, we have all kinds of stuff. Now, if we find the right filter that's going to get the microplastics out of the water system before it gets into the marine environment, is that going to raise all of our sewage rates? Yes. But maybe that's a cost that we need to think about. And maybe putting that kind of requirement in permitting for wastewater treatment plants will innovate the technology, right? Um, I don't know if any of you students do things if you aren't assigned to do them. I would guess probably not. I mean, that's human nature. We tend to not do things unless we need to. So I'm thinking, you know, can, can we use the existing water management strategy we already have and deal with these microplastic particles in our wastewater treatment system? The land-bound waste management strategy, I mean, that's the pipe. That's what we got to get at. So let's assume that we're reducing our packaging, we're, redu we're doing the cleanups, but really it's, it's the waste mismanagement that we have got to try to get a handle on if we want to be serious about that. And there's all kinds of ways you can do that. There's all kinds of incentives that you can do that. Are straws and, uh, and plastic water bottles, are those the biggest culprit by weight of all that plastic trash? No. But it gets people's attention. And maybe then they're more receptive if they go to a store and, you know, you got to pay a nickel extra if you want a plastic bag. Or maybe there's a paper bag next to your plastic bag in the produce section. And you can have a choice, right? So there's all kinds of ways to drive behavior both from the voluntary feel-good sort of things to more overt regulatory schemes that require you to do things. And I think with this one, we really need to think about waste management regulation and waste water management. Because we, we know we have those tools. We just maybe need to apply them to this particular pollutant. So microplastics and seafood. So this has gotten so much attention. So this headline uh, got coverage all over the world when it came out in March of 2017. And I've had students say, oh yeah, I don't eat seafood anymore. It's got too many plastics in it. The problem with that study was it was only 17 individuals in Belgium um, and they actually estimated that in order to get this figure of 11,000 particles, you'd have to eat four oysters a day or 17 to 19 mussels a day. Now, some parts of the world, they may eat that much seafood. Americans certainly don't. Um, so that has caused confusion, and we know consumers are easily confused. Um, and there's a lot of literature on how people figure out how to make good health choices. But seafood seems to be a particular confusing, vexing one, especially for American consumers. And we don't consume a lot of seafood compared to other parts of the world. So the other thing I started thinking about, well, so what kind of consumer advice do we need? So in a way, this horse is kind of already out of the barn. People are already freaked out about seafood with microplastics, never mind eating the apple that came in the plastic bag, right? Or the bread that's in the plastic bag. They're not freaked out about that, but they're freaked out about you know, the once or twice a year they may eat, enjoy a plate of mussels with white wine and butter and shallots, which is really delicious. Um, so, so I started thinking, well, you know, what do, we, what do we know about consumer advice and how are we going to get ahead of this particular issue? Anybody know about the seafood watch card? Okay, so all these seafood guides are, and that's a whole other study, that's a whole other topic because there's different organizations that put out these guides to try to help consumers make choices. It can be based on their health, it can be based on environmental sustainability. But the organizations that put them out usually have some sort of bias in putting out those cards. Consumers are in a hurry. They, give, give, just tell me quickly. I'm not going to read a study on it. Give me a red light, green light, yellow light, whatever. Tell me if it's a good choice or not. So we already know that that's confusing to people. The other thing we know is that even when the advice is right, people flip out. So uh, about 10 to 15 years ago, um, Pregnant women and women of childbearing age got very concerned about eating any fish at all because of mercury. And so they stopped eating fish altogether. And the FDA realized, whoa, we got to give them some more accurate advice because fish is actually a really good food to eat when you're pregnant. Um, it's actually good for a lot of us to eat. And especially all you older men in the audience, not to pick on you, but you should be eating way more seafood than the young women of childbearing age in the audience. But consumers don't always hear that. They hear salmon, mercury, oh, PCBs, I'm not, I'm not eating any salmon, right? So we know that consumer advice is tricky, and we don't have any sense of good consumer advice for this microplastics issue yet. Um, and again, we, you, can, you can do the seafood watch sort of advocacy guide. This is the FDA's guide uh, for seafood consumption, but we know consumers are easily confused about this. So I think that's another challenge to think about with microplastics. 
So just to wrap it up, when I think about um, this particular emerging pollutant issue, and again, trying to match it up with how I think about other pollutants, I think there's a few areas we can think about. I love my scientific colleagues in the marine science department. The literature on microplastics is fascinating. Everybody wants to study everything about it. That's terrific from an intellectual point of view. I don't think that's what we need. I think we need targeted research. We need targeted research about the impacts of microplastics on fish that we like to eat on the seafood that we like. We, we, we know people are concerned about that. We know it's in there. We need some targeted research to inform that. Um, we have some regulatory tools. Clean Water Act is one. We know how to deal with waste management. We have tools to deal with Clean Water Act. We can argue if we're really good at using those or not, but we have some tools in thinking about how to keep the waste out of the marine environment in the first place and get it out at the wastewater treatment plant level. And finally, it's, a lot of it's about consumer behavior, our own behavior. So is that skipping the straw? Is it bagging the ban? Is it store, you know, it, where, where is that tipping point where uh, industries are going to respond to consumer demand or to a legal mandate? And I don't know what that is. There's a variety of tools that you can, that you can think about. But that's what I'm thinking about this issue is let's, let, we can learn a lot. We've learned a lot about dealing with pollutants in the last 40 years. We passed a lot of laws. We've made a lot of progress. We have bald eagles back because we banned DDT. But now we have a new emerging pollutant. And I think we should look to our past to inform some very strategic choices going forward with how to address this. I think that might be it. Nice. So thank you for having me. And I hope I've teed things up for our next set of speakers. Well, first off, I'd uh, like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me and uh, Tony and getting to meet some uh, very interesting people who I have known for a little bit of time but have never met previous to this. What I'm going to talk about is, and I put up here the inadequate research on ecological and human impacts for microplastics exposure. Uh, the reason I put that up is because even though we know plastics have been around for a long period of time, when you start really looking at the mechanisms or the actual impacts, except for ingestion of large quantities within large mammals or birds or those kinds of exposures, once you start looking at impacts on microplastics, there's much less information. And actually in the uh, survey which was done, it was interesting to me that, in actual fact, most people don't even know what microplastics are and haven't even considered them, partly because of the fact that we think of plastics as one sort of common type of product, when in actual fact it's not. And the, most of the issues and the bans, even within the state, have been concentrating on single use which I think, single, in my personal opinion, single use should be stopped. It is one of those issues which is a product which is made really for our convenience. It is not being made for long-term use or for even for being able to reuse it. And as our previous speaker said, we have been packaging things from the grocery stores and from other stores with bags and with natural products for a much longer time than we've been doing uh, with plastics. Next slide. Okay, this slide uh, I put up because of the fact that this is important for you to realize. We talked about the sources. We know, we know that most of the plastics actually uh, come from either gas material which is being produced from the petroleum indus industry as a waste byproduct. Plastics evolved out of a use of a byproduct which was a waste. They were able at that point in time to figure out a way to actually convert a waste into a product, therefore making a lot of money. Certain oil companies, it doesn't matter whether the petroleum product goes down as long as the plastic materials that they're making continue to go up because they can balance one versus the other. 
So this is an, is an instance where that industry saw a waste, converted it into a product, and is making a lot of money. So the idea here is, is that you have to reduce the production of that, but also if plastics are not going to disappear, they're going to be here forever. There are certain uses where plastics are actually extremely important. The idea is, is that once you use that plastic, you have to have a means by which to reincorporate it back into the cycle of use of the products without endangering the environment or the humans. And we've talked about the fact that it comes from a number of different sources, gets into our aquatic ecosystem, moves through the ecosystem, ultimately can get to man. One of the things that I wanted to point about in humans, we talk about ingestion and inhalation. And there's also a situation where most people don't really realize that in many of your pharmaceuticals and in many of your personal care products, plastics are deliberately added to those for either being used for abrasive products or for actually giving it bulk to be able to be used so that they don't have to increase the active ingredients very much, but they can fill it with what they consider a product which is non-reactive. Next slide, please. So microplastics, as we've said, uh, are normally defined between five millimeters and one nanometer in length. I put this the slide up on the left to basically show you a small piece of microplastic, which is in a small analyd, we're actually a small sponge area with sponge, which is being engulfed by that. That gives you the idea of the size, and then you can also see that the pebbles along the uh, shoreline on the on the right hand side. But the other point I want to make is that I think that microplastics the utilization of that term should be far expanded, partly because of the fact that we talk about large plastic materials like bags or reuse or, or uh, products which you can still recognize. What happens, however, is they break down, and they continue to break down. They break down even into the nano size, which is literally the sizes when you're talking about that, you're talking about the size of a virus or a bacteria. And you also have to realize that in many of the manufacturing products that are currently out there, there are specifically nanoparticles which are being made, which are made of plastic, as well as other products for being able to be used for delivery purposes. So you have that type of exposure. Next slide, please. So the other thing is we talk about different types of plastics. Plastics are not just one product. They are manufactured they can be either what we call primary manu uh, microplastics, which are microbeads, your de microbeads which are in detergents, believe it or not, in your detergents, in many of those, you actually have microbeads which are present, which will give you your slow release over time so that your phosphates and your suds can be maintained in a low level. You also have noodles or pellets which are used, or the other is, which is, which, um, and I'll give a, uh, Judy Weiss and I have this discussion about the fact that the most common micro is actually microfibers from your clothing, from being able to do your laundry every day. A simple filter on the end of a, on a wash cycle could actually remove a tremendous number of these microfibers getting into uh, the environment itself. Next slide, please. They also have what we call secondary plastics. Now these are plastics which are pieces which break down. What you don't realize, if you think about your plastic chair that you've had out in the backyard for multiple years, why does it crack? Why does it break down? It's because that plastic is actually being held together by a number of different types of products which are infused into it. And the UV light will allow that to break down. So as it breaks down, those are forming little particles. You notice on your plastic chair in the backyard, you know that, that white area which you get and you wipe off? Those are all microplastics because the plastics are now being released. You're actually getting an abrasion. So these kinds of, of micro-sized products uh, can actually be called secondary microplastics. They're coming from larger pieces of, of materials which are breaking down 
in getting into the environment. Now, one of the ones that I, we, it's not really uh, plastic, but I put up there is uh, tire dust, which is also in an actual fact in the manufacturing of tires. There are also many of these small nano products which are also released. Next slide, please. This just gives you an idea of what some of the different kinds of plastics are. So when we say plastics, you are not talking about the same product. We talk a lot about polyethylene, or we talk about high density, we talk about low density, we talk about moderate density, but all of those are different types of materials which are made for different plastics. They're made that way because they give different properties to the plastics. They may make them more flexible, or they may make them harder. But I can tell you, as a toxicologist, those rings and those nitrogen compounds and those activities allow for metabolism to go on, which will create reactive products, which will cause tissue damage within the animal who is absorbing it, either in the aquatic environment or in the human environment. Thank you. This just gives you an idea of the, of we do a lot of work with a small fish species, but this kind of gives you an idea that, and I'm grouping these together. One of the things that we find with a lot of these microplastics or pure plastics that we're looking at is that they seem to affect growth. And this is, occurs in a lot of different organisms, a lot of different aquatic organisms, whether it's a direct effect on their ability to get, not get enough nutrients or on direct toxicity. But what's shown here is this is total body length. And every single one of these plastics, which are shown here, are statistically decreasing the size of those larvae. You say, oh, what the heck? Well, the, the decrease in the size of a larvae in the aquatic environment is extremely important. And don't take this wrong, decreasing in the size of a fish larvae is no different than the decreasing the size of a at-birth child in the, in the placenta. So these plastics are being shown to affect growth parameters within eukaryotic organisms. Next slide, please. This also is another area which is we find that in many of these the heart or the pericardial sac is one of those areas which is also damaged. And this goes along, and this goes along for the legal aspect, for the mechanisms of action when we're talking about those. We know that from petroleum product particles, from soot, from various types of things that you are inhaled, one of the target organ systems is the heart and cardiac vascular damage we can demonstrate that there's an effect directly on the vasculature of the heart itself. And a number of studies are now showing that these, it may be either a particulate accumulation within the capillary beds of the, of the heart or in the kidney or in some of these other areas. Or it could be the product that I showed you before which is being metabolized locally and causing damage within that particular organ system itself. Next slide. I put this up. This is possible exposure to labeled nanoparticles in human lung and fetal lung and heart. Uh, Lehrer actually did a, a review in ES&T in 2019 and talked about the different types of particles. And, and we use fluorescent labeled uh, particles. And this actually happens to be uh, polystyrene labeled particles. And what's shown here on the left are actually lung cells where the particles are actually being accumulated and absorbed into the lung cells themselves. You say, well, oh, what difference does that make? Well, this is a single exposure. Think about the fact that if you are chronically being exposed to these and in your deodorants or in your other materials that you're using, you may actually get it through inhalation, this is a potential effect. On the right side is some work uh, by Dr. Phoebe Stapleton at Iyoshi, who is looking at, at um, the movement of nanoparticles through the, through the placenta into the rat pup. And what's shown here, now it, unfortunately the lights are a little dark, uh, too bright, but what you can see is those white spots are actually showing an accumulation within the rodent fetal lung on the other side of the placenta it's being exposed through the mother, 
and the rodent fetal heart where you're also picking up these particles. So what you're looking at is you're saying, okay, we now have a phenomenon which we can sort of understand in the fact that they are accumulating in the microvasculature of your very capillary beds or in tissues which will accumulate. What about the particles that you were ingesting in the, the, the lower portions of the GI tract where you actually have a number of different types of like pyres, patches, and other areas which will accumulate these kinds of materials. So what's the association with those kinds? So next slide. So that's what I wanted to point to you. And this is just to throw it out there, that these compounds, people will sit there and say, well, plastics are pretty innocuous. We don't have the proof to say that they are not. We do have the proof that they are very large quantities being produced, they are getting into the environment. There are multiple different types of sizes. There's exposure to humans and to aquatic animals. And there are apparent impacts, at least on the aquatic side. And there's a lot of work which is starting to go into the human side. So there. Wow. Well, that was shocking. I was, uh, thank you all for being here tonight, um, taking the time from that, this gorgeous day to be here to learn. I think you're finding, uh, learning some incredible information um, about not just plastics that we hear about all the time, but how they're getting into the food chain and how they're destined to affect us. So I'm here to talk about um, the ocean obviously, and uh, talk about, I'm going to get us back on a, on a happy track a little bit, um, <laughs> because this is the area of ocean that Clean Ocean Action focuses on, um, and we've worked with Tony with, for years, and we're really excited to be working with Randall and, and working with Monmouth University on, on so many of these issues, so I, I am grateful to be here. And on the many issues of the ocean, we've worked with Keith Cooper years and years ago when um, the real threat was from ocean dumping. We literally had eight ocean dump sites off our coast where we were dumping sewage sludge, acid waste, industrial waste, toxic laden muck that was getting into the food chain. And Dr. Keith Cooper and his research on PCBs um, and dioxins and other materials and how they were getting into the food chain gave us the evidence, gave us the facts uh, to create the advocacy around that led to an end of ocean dumping. So it's so critically important to have scientists working on this um, and lawyers to, to bring about the change we, we all want to see. But I just want to uh, focus on where Clean Ocean Action works on. Um, there's a big, big ocean uh, in our good United States, and we work on this little pocket of water uh, known as the New York, New Jersey Bight. The word, how many of you have heard the word bight? B-I-G-H-T? Okay, so you know it's a, an indentation, a little, a little um, geological formation. So that's us. So here it is on a photograph that has, um, if, if the ocean were drained, this is the geology of the ocean. And so you can see that it, we, um, I'll just, because you know, during the glacial time there was a lot of water locked up. So this was where the mastodons roamed. And you know, a lot of commercial fishermen found mastodon bones and uh, ivory and teeth and things, which is kind of fun. Um, that, that rift you see out there though, this, um, that's the Hudson Canyon. The Hudson River continued to flow during those glacial times and created that canyon. And so we have this amazing underwater canyon, just like the Grand Canyon. It's about a mile deep, um, and it has a spectacular ecology. Um, so a lot of folks in our area don't know that we have literally a Grand Canyon right off our coast. And a lot of fishermen um, certainly do enjoy um, fishing out there. 
This is a, um, an infrared satellite photograph, so it shows temperature grades. And it is um, that little bite box is where we're, we're talking about. And what I like about this is to share, you know, another extraordinary feature about the Jersey Shore is that we get the warm waters from the Gulf Stream. That's that red water. You see that looks really scary, but it's just the temperature of the water. So we get the warm water coming up from the south. And then we get, in the wintertime more, we get the cold water, which is the blue water, the Labrador current coming down in the wintertime. So that's why we get so many amazing species. We get seals in the, in the winter and the, um, a lots of different migrations. Um, and this is one reason why we have so many extraordinary species. We have, you know, the ancient mariners, the horseshoe crabs. There are 33 species of um, cetaceans, whales and dolphins that frolic along the Jersey Shore at one time or another. Another, We have five species of sea turtles that visit the Jersey Shore. There's only seven species on the planet and um, five of the species head by the Jersey Shore um, and most of them are endangered or threatened. I think all of them are endangered or threatened. Um, there are about 300 species of fish and um, you know of all different shapes and sizes. Some of them are so cool and 350 species of birds, um, which depend on, on the shoreline. So we do have this incredible ecological feature and of course the really cute um, huggable megafauna, the seals, uh, as I mentioned, there's four species of those. So truly a very, very diverse area off our coast and one that we should be protecting for them as much as for us. Oh, sorry, yep, and 20, how, how many of you have ever seen um, an Atlantic sturgeon, either a short, short nose or a long nose sturgeon. Oh, I mean, they are incredible ancient creatures. I mean, and they used to get like eight feet long um, off our coast. And they used to be so thick in our waterways that they would harvest them for meat and they'd call them Albany beef because a lot of them were caught in the Hudson River when they were um, going up there to spawn. And they would just stack them up like cordwood, um, really. But there's not that many anymore. They are very, very threatened, but they are amazing dinosaur looking like fish. So as I said, we have a lot of diversity of, of life here and, and, and we must uh, protect it. We also have a huge economy that's based on a blue, the blue ocean economy is, um, you know, the Jersey Shore is really a huge contributor to uh, the state's economy and, um, you know, the housing values. Um, commercial fishing is also a big deal in, in New Jersey. I think we're the number one port for clams um, in, in the country. So again, we're, a lot of people don't know how, what a big role fisheries plays in, in the economy, but it, it's really important. And of course, we have many, many hundreds of thousands of recreational fishermen as well. So there's a lot of pressure on our fish. And, um, but I think the, thing, the, the greatest threat is the pollution that we put in the water and um, the plastics, of course, um, which are big pieces of chemicals, <laughs> as Dr. Keith Cooper showed us. Um, so again, the total economic value of the tourism industry along the Jersey Shore is 32 billion, that's with a B. Um, huge, huge economy. Uh, and the ocean also provides us with about 70%, depending, some 50, some 70. I know a lot of us are talking about the Amazon forest, which is so devastated now with the fires, but, and it being a, a sort of the lungs of the planet, but really the lungs of the planet is the ocean. It's providing up to 70% of the oxygen that we breathe. And the thing that stuns me so much about the ocean and all that it provides us and all that it gives us in gifts and bounty is that it provides us all these free. And all we have to do is take care of the ocean and, and keep it healthy. So um, never doubt, Margaret Mead, one of my, my hero, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. And indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So as in, hopefully as inspired as you have become but from the speakers here tonight, you can make a difference. Every one of us can become you know, a leader and change the way things are being done so that we can make the health, the, the ocean a healthier place. We just happen to be living downstream of the most densely populated urbanized area in America. Um, and in some instances, as pretty up there with the world too. Um, and just if you think about it for a minute, every 
especially in the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area where there's still uncombined sewers, every toilet, every washing machine, every shower that were talked about earlier, every street, um, it just washes directly into the waterways when it rains. You know, it doesn't take that much rain to trigger the, um, the systems to go into overflow. So you can imagine all the street filth, all the garbage, all the garbage juice, any, all the oil, all the contaminants that are on the streets in metropolitan New York, all the five boroughs, Jersey City, Hoboken, Newark, um, they're all on a combined sewer which washes all that waste in the water. So that's where we get a vast majority of our litter because it includes all of that litter that goes down into the storm drains and then goes directly into the waterways. Um, and again, this is during periods of rainfall. So that's a major, major source for us. Um, so back in 19, um, so this is obviously, I'm, I'm not going to spare you some of the pictures because I think we really do need to realize the harm that we've done. This actually, our areas of accumulation on the, on the Delaware River, which is a source into the ocean. There's um, pockets in the urban areas uh, along the entire waterfront here, as I just pointed out. Um, there's fishing equipment too, as was stated earlier. This is a fishing lure that a gull thought was really looking like a tasty fish. Um, there's uh, you know, um, lots of evidence. This was a, um, oh, this really hurt. Uh, this is a juvenile sperm whale that washed up over in Europe. And it had, look how emaciated it is. It fought so hard to live till it got to the point of this emaciation and there were 64 pounds of plastic in its stomach. Imagine the DNA that that juvenile sperm whale carried in him to pass on that will to live um, and succumbed. And I have to say, at least washed up on a shoreline where we could bear witness to that and again, do a call to action to try to stop this from happening in the future. And then this is one of, another one of the more famous um, photographs along with the turtle. Um, this is an albatross chick. Uh, the albatross nest in like middle of nowhere where very, very few humans go. And so all the plastics that are in the area out there are just you know, becoming a part of that, um, I call it chowder, whether it's stew or uh, soup or chowder, the plastic chowder of the ocean. And it looks like food to marine life. And so the adults go out to sea, they bring back, fill their bellies up with all this plastic, and then they regurgitate it, feed it back to the young. And then the young's bellies get so filled with plastics um, that they literally starve to death with their bellies packed with plastics. And then those plastics, you can see they're, they're doing fine. They'll take the next storm or the next uh, you know, wash, wash out to sea and, and continue the, the cycle and just keep getting smaller and smaller, as was also talked about. So back in 1985, um, long time ago, Clean Ocean Action started beach cleanups. Um, you know, first of all, to just get a baseline of what's out there on our, on our beaches and also as a gateway to give people something to do. It's a great tool. Um, and I, I agree um, that they are not necessarily the solution, but they are a great way to get people educated and motivated about the problem. Um, so it's the, one of the longer, longest running um, biannual, we do two, one in the spring and one in the fall in the country. We have 69 locations now. It's a grassroots citizen science project, and I'll go to that in a, min in a minute. And, um, as of last year, we had collected almost um, 7 million pieces of trash off the beach. I think now by next year, by the end of this year, we will have um, hit 7 million. But the key thing with us is that not only do we um, you collect that data, but we try to, again, take it to another level. And this is some artwork that was done by um, members of the Rumson Garden Club, as a matter of fact. One is uh, an artist, Lucy Callion, and every piece of that plastic was picked up um, from beaches at Sandy Hook. And the, you can't see it on the slide, but the striped bass over on the right-hand side, the fins, the caudal fins are um, syringes. Um, and all the bottle caps you can see and the straws on the bottom. The crab actually was made out of a mini football. Um, and you know each of the items so it, it stops people people want to look at it people want to see what it is and then we're able to educate them about how 
their use of plastic, their non, their poor management of plastics gets out into the ocean. The other one was um, also Rumson Garden Club artist Stella Ryan, um, and um, this was trash picked up on the Seabright beaches, and King Neptune's entire chest there is out of cigarette filters. So, uh, and again, these were just items that were picked up in one day. So we do more than just use it as opportunities to educate. We actually, it's kind of challenging, it's not um, collect data uh, from our beach sweeps. It's important that we just not turn these one days of getting the beaches clean and saying ta-da, um, because the beaches will be dirty in another week or so, um, but that we actually collect the data so that we have evidence. And um, here's the data card, there's over 100 items. Um, we've got at least 25 years of this data set that um, is being uh, used, and uh, the small and the tall are, are invited, and we get about, you know, between six and 10,000 people out on the beaches um, each year to collect this evidence. And so it does, it does um, provide us with some, some great information. And I encourage you all to go to our website and antiquated as it is, we're working on that, um, and go to the beach sweep section and look at some of the... Um, the totals because it's stag staggering. So I think um, last year, just in 2018, we had about 10,000 volunteers who collect over who collected over 420,000 pieces of trash. And you know, it's it's startling when you see you know 34,000 cigarette filters. Um, the good news about the cigarette filters is that they are going down. Um, however, e-cigarette waste is going up, and we are in fact considering adding them to the data card. The other little evil thing, that single-use thing that people seem to be excited about and using and leaving on the streets so that they wash into the waterways and then into the ocean are these um, com combo um, toothpick slash um, floss device. I don't know if you've seen them around, but people apparently do a lot of um, dental health cleaning, and which is a wonderful thing. But, um, you know, don't throw your toothpick um, on the water. I mean, if, if a bird or a fish eats that, it's got an extremely pointy end, and, you know, it could puncture the... might be a faster death, but it would be, um, it would be painful and, and horrible, very painful, um, and ultimately lethal. Um, balloons are interesting. Balloons are on the increase. More and more, we're finding more and more balloons on the beach. And, you know, that's kind of a not, that's kind of, again, one of those no-brainers. If you have a balloon, you know, treat it carefully and don't let it go. And purposefully le le releasing them is really nonsensical. And I think people just don't think that they have any kind of um, unintended consequences. But we all know that, um, or many of us know that balloons in the ocean look like, um, sea tur to sea turtles, they look like jellyfish. And... So sea turtles will eat the, um, the, bat, uh, the balloons with the strings especially. There's also um, the uh, whales get them because they, they just take a big swath of ocean, so they get all kinds of things. And then just notably, the balloons with the strings are even you know, doubly harmful because the string is also plastic and lasts forever and entangles a lot of animals. And you can't see that picture at the end, but that's a, a, a wing of a turn that had been, uh, the balloon had wrapped, the, the string had wrapped around the bird's wing, hobbling it. So I'm sure a fox or a raccoon or something gobbled it up, but the wing, you know, they put aside the wing, not much meat there, and um, the string looks great. It's perfect condition. It'll go on to uh, entangle somebody else. So this data has lots of numbers and lots of trends and, and increases. You can... Um, you know, go there and really find a lot of information for your research papers if you care to. Um, but again, a lot of what was said earlier, most of the material is plastics now. Oh, so we use this data. This is really important. We don't just share the data and do research with it, but we also, um, it's used to create state and federal laws. So for example, the um, Microbead Free Waters Act that was passed in 2015 and now makes it illegal to have microplastics in cosmetics and toothpaste and other kinds of things that um, Congressman Pallone used the data uh, from our beach sweeps to do that. There's a statewide ban on smoking on the beaches in New Jersey, on all public beaches, um, which was the data was used for that. There's lots of ordinances, I think, um, there are, uh, I think I have a slide actually, yeah. Um, 
There, in New Jersey, the number of ordinances banning certain single-use plastics, again, not the ultimate solution, but a step in the right direction to increase awareness. Um, we have 23 towns with bans of some single-use plastic or another bags, um, foam containers or straws are usually the, the three most, um, most used, but most banned. But, and then there's 17 that are going to go into effect um, in 2020. And 26 towns have passed balloon release um, bans. You can't intentionally release balloons. So again, used as awareness tools to, to drive some action as we kind of figure out what we're going to do. Um, so it's staggering to think that every, nearly every bit of plastic, and I, and I added the word nearly because there are some efforts to go out there and pick up the plastic that's out in the ocean. Every bit of plastic that's in the ocean is still there and increasing every second and getting smaller and smaller and smaller and more bite size, as everyone has already said. Here's a, a slide with a lot of microplastics on a, on a penny. Um, you can't really see, but there's a copepod, which is at the very base of the food chain. A lot, a lot, a lot of life likes to eat copepods, and, create, and those animals eat those animals, and those animals eat those animals. So it's a, it's a very base of the food chain that's getting impacted, and there are microplastics um, in that copepod. So Clean Ocean Action has been doing some research to try to, again, get, the, get a baseline study about um, the doing microplastics research and using, um, we use the citizens to create the, uh, to do the science so we get more and more people engaged. We worked with a, a high school in particular. Um, and we also get this information, not to just get the information, but to use it in an advocacy way to find and promote solutions and actions like we did with the beach sweep data. So there were 13 locations along the Jersey Shore, most extensive study done yet. Um, in all four coastal counties. We took 39 sand samples and 39 water samples, and we looked um, because we're, we're, you know, we wanted to be uh, super scientists, I guess, but uh, we looked at the micro level. We looked at um, 0.7 micro millimeters. Um, and uh, the study will be out by the end of the year. Um, but, you know, spoiler alert, don't think that there's even one place where we didn't find them. They're everywhere, ubiquitous. Uh, Katie Tobin on our staff, she's our microplastic researcher. She's currently getting her PhD up in Boston. Um, and she was lead on, she's, um, you know, kind of also uh, doing research on microplastics for her PhD. She's also the lead um, on a microplastics work group that um, brings together over 600 national and international sciences, scientists, educators, and policymakers and citizens to try to drive um, you know, uh, science um, that would be consistent, standardized science, so that we can look at apples and apples instead of apples or, and, um, and also um, you know, try to engage on finding you know um, solutions that are you know that we can do anywhere in the country or the world, so she meets with them I think peer, at least every other month and um, has uh, sends out uh, weekly updates on all the microplastic research that's happening. So you can get on that list if you'd like or if you're interested um, to find out what's the latest and the um, good news, bad news, and ugly news about microplastics. Um, I'll end with a pitch to come to our beach sweeps. Um, we have one coming up on October 26th. There are 20, uh, as I said, there's, uh, I think, 69 locations, but there's a couple here right in uh, Long Branch, and there's a, a bunch of um, Monmouth University students have um, traditionally come out to, uh, to the different sites. Some of them have um, selected their own site and worked on their own site, so that's, that's coming up. It's a few hours that can make a big, big difference. Um, we also have internships, sorry, uh, Tony, if that I'm allowed to pitch uh, internship opportunities. We, are, we, are, we have a new office right here in Long Branch up, um, up by uh, Seven Presidents Park. Um, but I'll also kind of, um, kind of emphasize to you all that, that the ocean is only going to be as healthy as the next generation makes it. It's been, you know, we are working hard. There's a lot of people working now, but we have to continue. You all have to, you know, um, get involved and become the researchers of the
the next generation that find, meaning, find, find better solutions and find even more meaningful ways and wean us off of the plastic habit altogether. So I look forward to working with all of you and, of course, Monmouth University and Tony, and thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. So very quickly, I'm just going to hit a couple of the highlights uh, from uh, the poll that we did. Going backwards here. Uh, so we did a survey of New Jersey residents. We just wanted to get a general sense of what was out there. There was a question, um, and you'll see at the end, um, talking about the topic of microplastics. And I said, I could probably do a poll about that in the general public in one question, which we basically did. Uh, but I want to start with some things about just generally, you know, what's the sensibility out there? And, uh, you know, the first question we ask is, you know, what's, is, it a, is it a problem? And we have vast majority say, yes, it is. And it's a very serious problem, 64%. Nearly two-thirds of the public automatically say it's a very serious problem. Uh, and almost everybody else says it's, it's at least somewhat serious. So we're starting off with the premise that, yes, it's a serious problem. People have heard about this. They've heard that plastics is a problem. And so when we get to the next step, so what should we do about it? Should we ban plastic bags? And we have 65% of the public say, single-use plastic bags, yes, ban them, sure. Uh, but then we say, well, here's one way you can ban them, and then suddenly it all falls apart. Uh, and that's uh, the idea. Okay, so if we actually ban the single-use plastic, by the way, when we're talking about single-use plastic bags, we're talking about the ones that you get at the supermarket, at the, at the, at the store. Uh, you know, you go shopping, clothes shopping, grocery shopping, whatever it is, that's a single-use plastic bag. So plant banning that means that they wouldn't have them anymore at the store, and then suddenly they say, oh, that's not good. So 31% still say, yeah, that's, I, I get it, that's, that's what we mean, ban them. Uh, another 27% say, well, maybe not ban them, but let's, let's like have a cost offset for them. So if you really, really want one that you can get one, you have to just have to pay for it. And then 39% say, no, wait, no, they should still be able to get, get them out for free, which means some of those people who said, yeah, I'm for a plastic band bag, say, oh, no, 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 give them out for continue doing what we're doing right now, now that you've told me that it's going to actually change my behavior. Um, that, that change is different. So that's, that's the challenge uh, in terms of, of the overall impact. So people get it, they hear it, they understand it, that, that, it's a, that it's an issue, but then when you get into the every day-to-day -day life, uh, that's where you start running into roadblocks. Then on the issue of microplastics. So we describe, we actually describe microplastics to them in the way that you've heard here tonight. You know, either two ways, primary, where there, there are beads that are made in, in cosmetics or, or, so, or other products, or they break down, larger products break down to, to minuscule microscopic pieces. And we find that basically half of the public say, you know, I haven't heard of this at all. Uh, you know, and then you got another 20% or so, 25% uh, maybe, uh, who say, who kind of fudge it and say, oh, well, I guess so, I have microplastic, I've heard of that, right? When we boil it down to somebody who we, we think, we've, we had a follow-up question about, well, how big of a problem is this compared to larger plastic objects? We combine all the questions and we try to kind of drill down. It's probably less than 30% of the New Jersey public know at least something about microplastics. They have some knowledge of that and understand that it's an issue of some sort uh, in terms of uh, being part of the marine waste problem. So I, and there's a long way to go. So basically less than 30%, I would say, are, uh, at least nominally aware or minimally aware of microplastics as an ocean pollution problem. So those are the basic uh, issues that I um, wanted to hit on with that, um, just to give you an overview. And the, and the poll itself is available on our website uh, at mammoth.edu slash polling, and you can get to see the whole set of results there. But I want to start with that as, you know, you, we've heard about all these problems. And we had an issue um, last year where there was a not a plastics ban, but a fee on plastic bags was passed by the legislature. The governor vetoed it because it did not go far enough. Yet, we haven't seen any action at all here in New Jersey moving anything like that forward. And here we see some of the challenges about that. So I'd like to start off by asking you about how you think we tackle those challenges of getting the folks out there in the public to understand what we're talking about here tonight. 
I don't know, come over here and do this. Is that on? Yep. So it comes to me first, so I guess I got to come up with something to say. I mean, I, I, think, I think you need so many prongs to this problem. Um, so even though skip the straw, ban the bag is not going to remove the bulk of plastic waste, it's a great way to mobilize attention. Um, one of the more effective ways of changing people's behavior is educating the kids, because then they come home and they nag their parents, <laughs> and they hold them accountable. Um, so that may be a great way to kick off some renewed attention to the single-use ban on, on single-use bag ban. Um, and all the other, you know, so the, 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 the reaction to, yes, I should ban, we should ban bags, but the, the different responses to the different schemes I just find fascinating. Um, we have several bag bans in several municipalities in Maine. Um, and you really have seen over time people's reactions change. They do change. Some people still get very cross if they have to pay a nickel for their bag, but you see more and more people lugging in their, their totes. There's more totes that you can buy that are available right up front. So it's, uh, there's so many different prongs, but I guess one, one thought I have, since you had some momentum and didn't go anywhere, go, go get those kids, get them flipped out. They'll bug their parents. All right. All right. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this to the institutions. How many universities in this state have actually decided that they are going to reduce plastic in their own use? I'd say zero. New Jersey. I know that Rutgers has done some reduction, but it is not. It has not gone to a zero. So in some ways, it's, it's, what, it's what you said earlier. It may be important that the smaller organizations, which are, have a captured audience, can actually initiate some of these things and actually start to get a groundswell on that kind of an approach. Because the argument that I've always heard is they say, well, we really can't do it. Nobody's really demonstrated how to put it in place. That's the argument I've heard. And yet, no one in the higher education has even approached it. And yet, we talk about our engineering schools, we talk about our health schools, we talk about our policy, and have we just kicked the can down the road, just like everybody else. So I think actually getting local, smaller, either universities or to, to take the lead might actually be a good way to go. Yeah. I, I, well, I certainly think um, that that would be a, a really good s start. I mean, we, we work with a lot of corporations where they come out on the beaches and then we talk to them about what, what's in their cafeterias. You know what is in what are in their what's in their cafeterias and you know they're they stop to think and it's mostly disposable items but you know hope meant several of them have made changes I mean they're bigger companies that have more resources that can make those bigger changes but um, I think universities are real low hanging fruit I mean you know the uh, for students to rise up and demand from the school board that we do more. And it doesn't have to be everything all at once. You know, just wean yourself off. Pick, you know, two or three items a year to uh, reduce. It's going to get challenging when you get down to um, items where there are no other alternatives. But we always say, you know, choose, the, choose to eliminate um, your use of the product at all, like straws. I mean, you know, we all survived without straws, so we don't really need them at all. There are some people that may need them but um, for health reasons, but basically we don't need a straw, so that's elimination. Um, if you kind of need the product, um, there's reusable alternatives like a coffee mug or things that you all, you students are all bringing, your water, reusable water bottles. Um, so that eliminates the, the actual um, need for 
disposable item. If it's got to be a disposable item, there are um, there are paper products and and things like that. But you know, the market is um, quick to try to respond, right? So there's biodegradable plastics out there that a lot of businesses have shifted to, which um, you know, look at us, we're doing the right thing. But first of all, a lot of these compostable, um, degradable plastics require very industrialized, in, um, com uh, industrialized composting facilities to break that stuff down. It has to be almost at 300 degrees and turned every so often. And, you know, it's a very high process to recycling that compostable um, plastic. And then the other thing is that some of the plastics have a corn or a, um, a dissolvable polymer between or um, molecule between the polymers. So you're actually expediting and increasing microplastics because you're getting stuff out there that breaks apart more quickly, but breaks apart into the sizes that get up into the food chain. So it's, it is complicated. It requires research. It requires you know thought. Um, but I think that would be a great a great idea if the students um, did get involved in that and. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that there is a Senate bill, um, Senate Bill S-776, uh, which bans bags, um, foam containers, and um, allows for, uh, kind of hides the straw um, because the um, d community association um, that represents people with disabilities felt that banning the straw was, was not, um, was unacceptable. So it's kind of hiding the straw, putting it aside so that uh, it's not readily available and you have to ask for it. Um, so that, that bill, uh, I think, it has hope for the lame duck session. Um, and, you know, we have some amendments we'd like to see. There's another organization that knocks on doors called Clean Water Action people to sign uh, petitions and write letters. So there's been some groundswell. I was in the camp of um, urging the governor to ban that fee bill because it was, uh, it was a nickel. And we only get, I think, would get one bite at trying to get the state to do something. And a fee was, the, you know, was not going to get the long-term effect that we wanted. So we urged for the, um, for the governor to, to uh, veto it and have been putting a lot of effort into this, uh, this ban. But again... It's three items or categories of items, and it's a good start. But, um, and I like to think of New Jersey as being at the front of the line in terms of environmental leadership and stewardship. We have been in many, many instances, but there's a lot of states, including California, that have um, taken action. The European Union is going to be phasing out single-use plastics over time by, I think it's 2030. Um, so there are big things happening out there, and... Um, you know, we need uh, the next generation to help rise up like you are on climate change and other issues to help get rid of this plastic plague. Uh, I, I think one of the things that I, I, I walked away with, and um, not only from the poll, but actually from sitting here tonight myself, is that this issue is huge. And you know, the bigger the issue, the harder it is for somebody to come to grips with it. And I think that's one of the problems with, um, with, with plastic bags and the plastic bag bag. Once we start moving down, you know, asking people, okay, this is how it's going to affect your life. And they're saying, whoa, this is just, that, that's too much part of my life. It ha you know, it's ubiquitous, it's every, everywhere. Uh, and a couple of things that were mentioned tonight, whereas um, Dr. Cooper mentioned you'd like to expand the, the definition of microplastics. Uh, Dr. Faraday mentioned that you would like to see more targeted research. Um, so I'm just pulling out those as, as two different things. And I guess we, in, t in the public policy realm, one of the things that we're looking at legislatively are these single use items like bags and, and straws, things that people can more easily get their mind around even though it's, it's a huge part of their lives. So my question is, is there something else that the public policy world should be looking at in terms of dealing with uh, plastics or microplastics that would have uh, a, either a bigger impact in the end or, or, or at least an equal impact to a single uh, use ban? Can I, I'd like to, um, because I actually was talking to Dr. Cooper about this earlier, and, as, and I, 
as I've said, you know, they're good, these things, these things that are happening are good starts, but we really have to look um, at the very base of the problem. We have to look at what, what, why we're, manuf not only, you know, the manufacture of the plastics itself. You know, why do we have seven different plastic items that we use for disposables? And some of them, you know, we don't really know what the numbers mean. We know that one and two, are sort of recyclable, but you can't really find them on the items. You gotta look under the light and try to figure out what it, number it is. And now that China has rejected most of our um, recycling because it contained too much garbage because we are terrible recyclers. Um, we, have a, we have a really wonderful opportunity for, you know, in the United States to take ownership of our waste stream and create a solution that minimizes the amount of plastics, you know, utilizes the plastics that we are generating as a raw material for, re, for creating new plastics, so we create a market for that recycling. Innovation is always, you know, the answer, um, and we just have to have the fire under us to get those, um, get those industries to have um, the incentive, and it's all supply and demand, right? So if we start by encouraging uh, that any plastic item be a certain percentage of, comp of recycled plastic material, just like we did with paper. You know, first it started at 25%. Um, municipalities, schools could require that any product that they buy, if they did, uh, any paper product that they bought had to be 25, then 50, then 100%. We can do the same thing with plastic and thereby create the market and the incentive for the entrepreneurs to kick in and start identifying and developing those you know ground level solutions that then would have enormous impact um, up the chain. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually we had actually had a um, a microplastics meeting a little while ago, and there were several entrepreneurs who were there, and. And, to, and I'll mention TerraCycle actually has approached a large number of uh, consumer product companies and other companies to actually develop reusable type of products. And, and the way in which they coined it was they called it the milkman type of, of approach where historically when, they, when the industry made a product, they owned the container and that they were responsible for the container. And so their whole philosophy, and they've been working with a lot of European com companies, a lot in the United States, where the industry is taking the responsibility for reusable and refillable containers that the consumer would like to actually have. So entrepreneur entrepreneurs like that are really important. The other one which came up, which, which was brought up about the, uh, I think you brought it up, about going to the dentist and, you know, and the surgical packs, which are sterile, with uh, many hospitals have a tremendous problem with plastics and what they were really used. So this company actually went in and has worked with a number of the large hospitals, uh, hospital complexes and corporations and have, have worked with them to take that material and actually reprocess it for reusable materials that they could use within, within the uh, hospital or within other units. So I think the idea is, is that we have been looking at the problem and, and what TerraCycle and they think of, which is they, they view the plastics as a commodity kind of thing, that how do you use it? And that's why these local, regional kinds of industries, which can recycle, set up the repackaging, and reuse, is a way in which you can, which you can, you can get away from that. Uh, and to be honest with you, the other thing is, is that in many ways, this whole idea about the different types of plastics and the recyclable ones, and I showed you all of those uh, different types of polymers which are made from these. We don't need all of those different polymers. There can be certain ones which can be utilized which are far less toxic, far less uh, of a problem. And that, 
that is something which also needs to be done and may have to be looked at on a legislative approach. Exciting. <laughs> um, so just one, one sort of cynical follow-up to that. I mean, it is still way too cheap and convenient for our stuff to be packaged in plastic. It, it just is. And in order for that, to, there's a lot of things that could make that change, but one thing I was thinking of when you were talking about that, in, in addition to innovation and entrepreneurship, is, you know, when consumers start paying a lot more for stuff packaged in plastic, they'll start voting with their pocketbook. When it's too expensive for companies to package stuff in plastic because there's a federal tax on plastic, and we're talking about carbon, you know, we're talking about all these different ways to incentivize behavior, and a lot of it, especially in a capitalist economy that we're in, it comes down to cost, right? So the corporation may want to do the good thing, but you know, geez, I mean, and, and, and we can try and vote with our feet as much as we can, but at the end of the day, you know, we're all making individual decisions largely based on our, on our resources and our means. So I, I think thinking about, about, again, that source thing, where is it getting into the system in the first place? Well, we're making it and we're putting it on everything because it's easy and it's cheap and there's no financial incentive. There's lots of philosophical incentives and scientific incentives to do it differently, but there's not a single economic incentive. Um, that's great, and I am looking and I'm seeing that we're over our time right now, so I don't want to go any further over, but I think we can do, uh, continue this discussion if anybody has any questions, we can come up and, and speak individually, but on that, uh, that note of some clear solutions, uh, and moving forward and trying to educate the public and maybe the best way to educate the public is to hit them in their pocketbooks <laughs> and, and then they'll learn about what's, go, what, what's going on uh, is the way to go. All right, I want to thank our, our panelists uh, tonight, uh, uh, Dr. Susan Faraday, Dr. Keith Cooper, and Cindy Zipf uh, for coming out tonight and sharing uh, all this wonderful information with us. Thank you, and thank you all. Thank you.